Hello and welcome to this episode of the Fortnightly Dispatch, brought to you by the Baker Street Irregulars. I'm Steve Doyle, and I'm your host. Well, I am very excited about today's episode. The uh, We're getting a little inside baseball here today, but it's going to be a fascinating conversation. We have two returning guests um, to the show. Our very first episode, um, many years ago, began, um, the podcast began with uh, Ray Betzner, who is um, the go-to expert on Vincent Sterrett, um, speaking about Vincent Sterrett. And Ray is back in this show today. And joining us also will be Steve Rothman, who is, I think, the world's foremost uh, expert on Christopher Morley. And I've invited the two of them back today so we can have a conversation about Alexander Wolcott. Many of you know the the sort of legendary uh, story about the very first Baker Street Irregulars dinner and how Vincent Sterrett was invited, invited, I'm sorry, Vincent Sterrett invited Alexander Woolcutt and they took two handsome cabs and they went and William Gillette showed up and it's a legendary story. Lots of facts, lots of myth. But we're going to talk today about, about Woolcutt and how he got there and his status as a Sherlockian and his status as a uh, Baker Street regular. And so it's lots to talk about. So let's get started. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome back to the Fortnightly Dispatch. I know, as I said, you've both been here before, and um, I've always threatened to bring you back. So here you are. <laughs> despite popular demand. <laughs> Good to my word, you're back <laughs> despite popular demand. But today, we're going to talk about. Um, uh, Alexander Wolcott. I, um, we all three sort of have an interest in him, and um, and uh, there's. I think we all have encountered things along the way here that have sort of uh, they had had us all independently question the um, the sort of popular understanding of what where he stands in the. Um, sort of the mythos of the Baker Street Irregulars and Sherlockiana in general, and and um, and have wondered uh, how much of that is true and how much of that is just myth. So I thought it'd be fun to talk about that. So, um, but it's probably important to talk about who Wolcott was. Um, uh, so who was he? He was a member of the Algonquin Roundtable. He was a literary critic. He was, he was a, a he was a yeah, especially a theater critic. I mean, that's how he kind of gained his first a large amount of popularity. And his theater reviews, people would read them because they were acerbic. They 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 could be uh, very loving and and they could be you know particularly mean. Uh, and uh, you know people he certainly built a reputation for for being uh, a writer who had a sharp tongue uh even for those whom uh he he said he liked uh so you know there there was um many uh, aspects to uh Wolcott um he, of all the uh, sharp wits of the Algonquin round table he was he was a particular bad boy and um enjoyed uh, that persona um you know used it a lot uh to intimidate people and um um, and for, and then for you know those who were his friends, they always had to kind of keep one eye out over their shoulder because you <laughs> never quite knew when Alec was going to turn around and you know bring out a sharp knife and and you know uh, just to stab them very gently and lovingly right in the back. And he was a radio uh, syndicated radio man and syndicated columnist, so he was known throughout the country, not just in New York and not just as subscribers to the New Yorker. Who would not be? I mean, it was had a large circulation, but it was not um, your man in the street. But he was a bold uh, face name. He was in the columns all the time. He was writing the columns all the time too, with his own friends, and um, so he was known. And 
then he had things in Saturday Evening Post and things like this so that you could read his opinions. He was well read. Um, he was, he had started out with his re real writing career during World War I on um, the AEF's newspaper, whose name is escaping me at the moment. But um, so, and it, he was one of the editors for that. And that's where he met many, many of the people who started the New Yorker and went along with them because they said, hey, and there's this wonderful picture of him at around the age of 30, so 1919, with Dorothy Parker and Charlie MacArthur and Harpo Marx and well, they all look like kids, but uh, they really all were. And you know, and here Wolcott is not the huge balloon of a man that he became later in life, mm -hmm. but he's thin, and which is fascinating to me. Still with the mustache and the glasses and the slightly owlish, waspish look. You know what I find interesting about him is he he's one of the early to me one of the earliest people uh, who becomes, who's, whose fame starts to transcend what he does, uh, you know, for a living. You know, he wasn't just theater critic. It wasn't, you know, he wasn't famous because he was, at some point he became famous because of his, of him. Because he was and famous. Because he was famous. And because of his personality, that bigger, he had a reputation. He had this reputation for being this sort of bombastic jerk. And, um, but I don't know. I mean, you always had the temp. I think you always had to sort of temper that persona. But that he was, was the man who came to dinner. So, um, you know, right. Yes, he was down, the man who came down, to dinner. Down, and Kaufman yeah. really, you know, played with that. And that, you know, became a movie and everybody knew it. And it played in various forms all over the country, too. Everybody and recognized him. That absolutely. There was him. no hiding it. He even played the role sometimes. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, he was, he knew it. Everyone knew it. And I think he kind of cultivated that persona. Oh, too. absolutely. There's no doubt about it. And, and so, you know, what pe people listened to what Wolcott said uh, and they, they, they enjoyed uh, his recommendations, uh, whether they were good or, or negative. And so to, to bring it back around to, to kind of uh, the area we're going to be talking about, one of the people who was anxious to get his approval was Vincent Sterrett. Uh, and, and uh, you know, as we'll, as we'll learn during the course of this conversation, Sterrett worked very hard to try to get Wolcott a, a copy of The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and, you know, he got to get his approval of it because he hoped that if if Wolcott were to say some good things about Starrett's book about Sherlock Holmes, this would help sales. And and Starrett's, Starrett's first novel that he had written, uh, uh, um, Seaports in the Moon, failed disastrously. And and one of the things that one of the lessons Starrett learned from that was trying to get as much talk as he possibly could, have as much buzz as he possibly could generate will help sales and so when someone like an alexander wolcott you know uh, was was seen reading his book or, or or said something polite about it that that really helped sales so you know his 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 blessing was something that people desired this is probably want that time to start talking about how you know we've got this circle of morleyites who, who are coming together you know this Three Hours for Lunch Club, the Grill Parser Club, they're all kind of like a gas cloud starting to kind of come together to form. A gas cloud, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Write your own joke. <laughs> the, uh, you know, coming to kind of coalescing to form, you know, the Baker Street Regulars. And, and I don't know, Steve, did, did Mor Morley and Wolcott did not travel in the same circles, did they? They didn't travel in the same circles, which is interesting because they were very similar in age. Um, Wolcott spent at least his high school years in Philadelphia because um, he went to Central High. His family was sort of gadabouts, but mostly centering on um, one of the remains of a utopian community in Northern Jersey, uh, the Phalanx which is in Phalanx, New Jersey, which is near Freehold, if anybody cares. Um, 
and who knows where Freehold is? No one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but um, but he was sent to family in Germantown, part of Philadelphia, and he was so he did go. You know, they probably were experiencing the same places in the center of Philadelphia, going to some of the same bookshops and and things like this at the same time. Um, you know, but they didn't seem to know the same people. I mean, there's not a lot of crossover when you read the letters and you see the names that he's talking with. Uh, Morley was occasionally contributed to uh, the New Yorker, the way Wolcott, I think, occasionally contributed to the Saturday Review, but they were not regulars to either one, and they were both occasionally in things like the Saturday Evening Post and other things. Morley was not successful in the radio. Wolcott was successful in the radio. Um, it's just interesting stuff and so th they had to both know each other they had to have run into each other over and over again at you know books lunch parties and things like this um so if they if they knew each other and encountered each other and wrote and kind of had similar not co-orbiting but they're all kind of in this they're both in the same universe there and yet neither one of them cultivated a friendship with the other i think that's kind of interesting I think it is too. I think part of it is they both were outsized personalities. Um, although lots of these people were outsized personalities. Uh, but um, they, I'm not sure that either of them could see how much they had to gain from the other. And they probably, and that was more than anything, that's what it was. They weren't going after the same market, though they were both writing familiar essays. They were doing it for different places, so they weren't in competition. But I think, you know, Wolcott looked at Morley and said, eh, what can this guy do for me? Morley looked at Wolcott and said, eh, you know. <laughs> and so, yeah. I, I think, I think it, it, it even goes just a little bit deeper than that. Morley was the center of his crowd, right? right. Um, whenever Wolcott entered a room, he suddenly decided, I, I need to kind of, I need to be the center. It, it was always the Alec Wilcott show. And, and there is only one star in the Alec Wilcott show. Uh, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think they kept separate orbits because, you know, they, you know, Alec Wilcott did not want any competition for that center space. But even when you look at their lists of friends, you don't see a lot of um, crossover other than Starrett and um, and Elmer Davis, you know, both of which, both of whom had uh, some associations, but not a lot. And, you know, New York literary world, then New York literary world today is not that large. Yeah. You stumble over the same people all the time. So well, it's just weird. I mean, you would think for that reason alone, that there just would have been some something. You know, but they yeah. seem to have chosen to stay in separate worlds, separate. Stay, stay out of each other's way. Lord. Each had their own camp and mm -hmm. cultivated it. Yeah. yeah, that's that's how it seems to me, and that's curious. So, but that makes it even more curious that Alexander Wolcott ends up at the first BSI dinner. So how, and he got there. He got there because he was not invited by Christopher Morley. He got there because he was invited by Vincent Starrett. But there's a chain of events that happen that help make that happen. Yeah, yeah. So it, it all starts with a practical joke. Um, H. As Bedford, all the best stuff does. Uh, H. Bedford Jones was one of, the, one of the most popular pulp fiction writers of his time and, and he wrote you know, I don't know, 80, 90 different books and hundreds and hundreds of short stories. Uh, when Starrett was struggling to get a penny a word for his pulp, uh, Bedford Jones was getting five and 10 cents uh, a word for, for his. So it just goes to show you what a difference there was in the world. H. Bedford Jones uh, also had a, a great sense of humor and he uh, started to pull a, a, a practical joke on Alexander Wolcott. Um, writing under the name H.E. Twin L's. Uh, he started sending letters to Wolcott saying that he had come across 
unwritten and unpublished, uh, unpublished um, Sherlock Holmes stories, including uh, The Adventure of the, of the Aluminum Crutch, uh, which we all know is mentioned uh, by Dr. Watson, but you know, was never written. Um, and he starts sending examples uh, to Wolcott. And Wolcott, you know, uh, knows a, a, a kind of a good story when he sees it. He's very intrigued by this. Um, and he sends it, the, these, these letters uh, to his uh, childhood friend, Logan Clendenning, and asks Clendenning to ask his friend, Vincent Sterrett, whether um, uh, Sterrett believes these are real uh, Arthur Conan Doyle stories or whether they're fakes. And so that's how Sterrett gets involved. Um, at first, it's, you know, Wolcott to Logan to Sterrett, and then Sterrett writing back to, to Glenn Denning, and then to Wolcott, and then pretty soon it's a direct line from Sterrett to Wolcott. Uh, by April of 1934, the year after Private Life of Sherlock Holmes comes out, um, Sterrett is writing directly to Alexander Wolcott about these uh, supposed stories by H.E. Twin L's. And if, in case you haven't figured it out, the, the two L's is H-E-L-L. -L. So the, you know, the it's hell. He, these, these are letters from hell. Um, so, so, you know, uh, stories from hell. So, you know, uh, Bedford Jones is having a great time with all of this. Um, Wolcott uh, apparently couldn't figure out that he was being spoofed. Sterry claims that he figured out it was his old friend, uh, H. Bedford Jones. Uh, by looking at the style of the writing and, and some other kinds of things. But at any rate, that's what starts the relationship uh, among these three and and how Starrett starts writing to Wolcott. Now, again, you know, Starrett is looking for uh, publicity for his book. He wants he wants attention for it. And Starrett also, you know, one of his great characteristics is his naive, naivete. Um, he's in Chicago and he um, he belongs to the Midland Writers Association, which is an organization that's devoted for writers to help support other writers. Um, if he understands that Morley and and uh, and Wolcott are in different kind of orbits, he, he doesn't say anything about that. I don't know whether he, he knows it or, or doesn't. And he's accustomed to, to writers supporting each other. So it could very well be that he kind of naively just kind of bungles into this kind of uh, the fact that these two people uh, operate in different camps and he's he's not really sure how how that works or or mm -hmm. what it means i can see that i can yeah, see that. absolutely because starrett does seem often naive for a professional writer about how professional writers work whereas with morley you can see from his early notebooks from when he was a college student that he's looking yeah. through all the different publications that are out there and seeing who writes what and you know what do they pay and what sort of things do they want and you know and already deciding with the short stories that he's written as a kid you know what he might try sending to who and I don't think Starrett ever tried anything like that but I have another question were any of these Sherlockian stories written uh published or in a different form or rewritten by um Bedford Jones and, and or was it was the whole thing just made up so, um, so apparently there, there, there were actual stories, um, but Mike Murphy, if you can believe Mike Murphy, Mike Murphy says uh, in, in a 1980 publication that, um, which is which is this, got it, uh, right, right. Um, that's 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 one hell of a title, by the way. Yeah, you know, uh, it takes up the entire page. <laughs> At any rate, uh, Murphy says that. Um, it, Starrett speculated that at some point uh, uh, Bedford Jones actually destroyed them. Um, so far as we know, they've never been published. Uh, I I don't I haven't looked through you know the Bedford Jones papers to be able to see whether they're sitting in some archive somewhere. But so far as we know, they they were never published. That seems odd. For somebody who you know was paid you know by the word. I can't see them wasting a story rewriting it. Yes, so that it wasn't Sherlock Holmes, but throwing it out. Mm -mm. There you go. A little, a little research for all of you out there. Yes. Get, get cracking on it. Let us know. Yes. 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 Let us know here at the Alexander Wolcott. Uh, <laughs> <Memorial> <laughs> <Headquarters>. <laughs> that's very interesting, though. It really is. That's a that's a little. Uh, we digress into a little side light there, but if they're out there somewhere, that'd be awesome to find them. That'd be great. Okay, so now we've established that they've communicated with each other. So 
you know, um, so the first, the first irregulars dinner is going to happen. And so he invite Starrett invites Woolcut to Morley's party. And wait, 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 let me just pause you right there. Starrett for years felt that the party was partially his rightly or wrong. He mm -hmm. felt the party was partially his. There, there were letters from him years after he stopped, you know, he only went to one BSI dinner years after he'd been to one BSI dinner where he, 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 he talks to people and he says, Oh, you're definitely an irregular. Now he might've met little I irregular instead of big I irregular, but nonetheless, uh, he, he feels that as, as someone who was there in the early years, he has uh, at least a, a kind of informal ability to buy fiat, make these kinds of announcements. Well, not only there in the beginning, but you know, his book kind of was a sparking plug for the whole thing to kind of get some momentum. So he probably did feel that way, you know? Or did he feel that he was making Chicago irregulars? Well, or it's unclear. Um, there are times when he makes it clear that, you know, he's got a Chicago uh, irregulars group and and you you are you are one of those, but uh, there are other times when he just writes to someone and says, you know, you are clearly an irregular, uh, and we and we do these things by fiat, and it it's it is unclear. So um, I, yeah. I think, frankly, at some point there must have been some communication between Morley and Starrett, which which essentially said, you know, Morley said, uh, please don't go around, you know, basically, and you know, saying people are members of the Baker Street Irregulars of New York. Uh, you know, if you want to do it of Chicago, that's fine. I. I that may have been a conversation the two of them had. I can't, I can't find a letter to those lines. And you've got more letters than anybody else does, Steve. In, in, and I, I can't um, remember anything. But, yeah. but I do plus, think, I do think he, I do think Starrett thought Chicago was co-equal, at least at some point. Uh, absolutely. But remember that Ben Abramson put out a, that certificate, uh, which he sent to subscribers, calling them uh, charter members of the Baker Street Irregulars. And yeah. It was very. Yeah. It was a. It was pretty loose in those early days. It was very loose, and I think it was very loose until probably the Styx years. But uh, in a lot of ways, <laughs> um, and we won't go into that now. Yeah, that's a. That's another show. Yeah, that's a but, whole other show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but, but, at any rate, so the the point is, Vincent Starrett invites Alexander Wolcott to to the dinner, and it must have happened. Um, you know, is somewhere in the kind of October, November period, because um, there is a letter that uh, Bliss Austin uh, quotes from in an article in this publication known as the Baker Street Journal, um, where, where Bliss, Bliss quotes from, from a letter um, that says, uh, this, is, this was a letter in, in um, November 20th. It's from Logan Clendetting to Starrett. It says, Dear Starrett, when you and Dr. Watson, Dr. Watson, get in the hansom on December 7th, look out for a veiled lady who will hail a hansom right behind yours and instruct the driver to keep your hansom in sight. And then he goes on, on and on here. So clearly the idea of Dr. Watson, who was Alec Wolcott, and Starrett getting in a hansom cab and going to the BSI dinner was something that had been planned, you know, weeks in advance. Yes. And, and, and Logan, Logan Clendetting knew about it. Um, and and so Starrett's invitation to um, to uh, Wolcott must have come, you know, in a, in a fairly in enough time so that Wolcott would have the ability to put together those plans. This was not a I'm going, you know, I, you know, uh, Starrett's in 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 New York and he happens to see Wolcott and he says, "Hey, come with me to dinner," kind of thing. This this was this was planned and well organized. Mm -hmm. I argue that it it would have been hard for this to happen without Morley being aware of it. I don't think Wolcott walked in the room and Chris Morley looked up and said, oh my God, why are you, why, what are you doing here? Yeah, because it's a small space. They were just in that room upstairs at Chris's cello. So you couldn't actually know that there would be a seat otherwise for a walk-in. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, Steve, I, do you think Morley knew in advance, Steve Rothman? There's, there's no way of, of telling since the only you know, the only uh, eyewitness account we have is Bob Levitt, who now he clearly hated Wolcott. Um, there is no <laughs> question um, 
that you know there he is writing almost 30 years after the event and with interpretively with feeling <laughs> indeed um, but you know but you know Wolcott's got his own account of the night and there's you know that it serves got some kind of um third hand account yeah and um which are, which is kind of what has entered into the public consciousness i think these sort of accounts that you know Starrett kind of shows up at a party that Wilcutt leaves his own party, which I can believe happened. And then, and then, oh, yeah. and then I think there was always a party at Wilcutt's house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. I think, you know, and they're, you know, they're, you know, they ride off into the night in the handsome cabs. You get the impression that Starrett's probably like, what's, you know, what is happening? I can't believe, you know, but clearly, clearly this was a thing that was planned. And then, um, yeah. Now, but my question is this so clearly there's a, there's the sort of the, myth, the myth, mythologized version of the of that first dinner which i love prefer to think of it that way but i'm you know pull it back a little bit here everybody and then but i do believe that wolcott probably dominated the conversation as he always did i do believe he hogged the attention of william gillette who showed up you know bob Livett doesn't hate him for nothing you know and then um and okay. then you know I think I think there's you know some things are true in that thing in that account, but but um but why did he go at all? I mean that's the question. That that it's you know because Freddie Steele and 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 Gillette were going to be there, and you know he was this he was a, as we said already he was a you know in love with the theater if you know he wrote about mrs fisk he you know to have somebody who had been walking the boards of the theater for 50 years um at this point was a, a chance to really sit down with gillette had to fill him with joy because gillette probably you know kept in had him and wasn't getting up to um he wasn't going to play croquet with uh Alec Wolcott at his house um, in Connecticut. So, um, Out on the island, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So um, that this was a, a way of you know cornering him and, and hoping to get something out of it. I really think that was a lot of it. And you know, the others, he knew everybody in the room, I would bet. He probably knew each and every one of those men in that room. Um, and they all knew him. Whether they enjoyed his company or not is another matter, but they all knew him. Okay, yeah, knew gentlemen. We need to take a break. We'll pick this up on the other side. All right, we're back. So, um, Ray, right before the break, I cut you off, but our clock was is demanding. So you were going to say something. Yeah, so, no, it just... Um... I do think that Steve Rothman is is right, and for me to acknowledge that, um, you know, it's it's already been one half gen of a gin and tonic. So, you know, there's a reason why I'm I'm willing to acknowledge that. <laughs> but beyond that, um, Wolcott did know most of those people in the room. So let's think about that room for for just a few minutes. Steve was talking about how tight and small it was. Most of this dinner goes by, and Gillette is not there. Gillette. Uh, shows up late because he has a lot of difficulty getting there. Let's face it, the guy's also advanced in age. Um, but he, he, he shows up, and once he walks in the room, Wolcott realizes that this is his chance. He's got to grab this guy and sit down and, you know, and, and kind of dominate uh, the conversation here if he's going to get anything out, out of this dinner that he might be able to use in some future kind of fashion. And I think at least in part, that's one of the reasons why uh, everybody else was so ticked off because, you know, Wolcott, his personality, he just subsumes uh, Gillette when, when Gillette comes walking in the room and, and that's it. It's over. The, it's, it's, you know, Gillette and, uh, uh, and, and Wolcott uh, having this kind of conversation with each other and everybody else is sitting on the outside looking in. Absolutely. Yeah, that had to suck. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's face it. <laughs> well, well, you know, so this idea that um, this idea that that Morley, you know, part of the part of the myth of that night is that Morley, you know, hated Wolcott and was, you know, I mean, maybe he had 
he eventually had reason to be angry at him. But did he hate him? I mean, was that, or did they, were they just, you know, did they just ignore each other? Well, Robert Keith Levitt, again, in his 1963 piece, um, said, said that he called him a son of a bitch, but, um, and doing it all in dashes in the Baker Street Journal because I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> but in a, a review of the letters of Alexander Wolcott that Morley wrote, in 1943, which came out immediately after uh, Wolcott died, within months, it seems to me, uh, he talks about this and he says, you know, um, I just have to blow this up a little so I can read it. Uh, Alexander Wolcott often remarked that he would love to live in a village of 200 people if he could choose the people. And then he goes on and uh, says, uh, I'll, no, he's telling him, Wilcott, uh, it would be easy to misunderstand Wilcott, and he would have done his best to help you to do so. A competent old horror was a term of affection applied to him by one friend, and New Jersey Nero was another. He often called himself a repulsive behemoth with elfin manners. His eagerness to scandalize the bourgeois, to dominate the scene, to subdue his own lurking uncertainties by an assurance that sometimes sounded shrill was surely part of a protective clowning to shield a very generous heart. This is not somebody who hates him. I mean, I will admit, you know, he goes on at the end and more or less ends. Uh, when he called his pieces shouts and murmurs, there were those who wondered when he would begin murmuring. <laughs> <laughs> the town crier was probably an apter title. No one ever danced in the streets with more sincere abandon. His hat was always in the air for some valiant vision. He kept any number of hats in the air at the same time. He was the most acid spinster of his time, a genuine showman and a genuine shrew. So I think that's a really honest mm -hmm. uh, understanding of Wolcott and not somebody who just hates the guy. He's dead. He could say whatever he wanted. Right. Nobody would care. And, you know, the Book of the Month Club, this was an alternate selection, not the main selection, but would have uh, sold it anyway. And yeah, interesting. Just, oh, lots of copies. Very interesting. But, well, then that brings us to the question. Um, that I uh, have, so two questions, one follows on the other. Was, you know, because the, the idea is that Wilcott's just sort of an opportunist, maybe looking to get near Gillette, looking near, looking to get near uh, Frederick Dor Steele, uh, maybe just kind of wanting to gate crash a literary dinner for whatever, you know, personal, whatever. That's sort of the idea that people have had for years and decades. Did, was that it, or was this a thing where he actually was a Sherlockian, and the whole idea of it spoke to him in some way, beyond just this silliness that, you know. Well, he loved mysteries. He loved true crime, especially. He writes about them over and over and over again in his books. Um, so I can't see that, you know, when he was told there's going to be a dinner, you know, for folks who love Sherlock Holmes, he didn't say, whoa, I'm there. Um, and yeah. I, I really think it was a genuine interest as well. And then, you know, he can't help himself. He's got a big star and a big star from, you know, when he was a boy, even um, there next to him, somebody who was a star before he was born. For somebody who lived and breathed American theater, this was a chance. I, I think that's right, Steve, and, and it just it, it goes back to that first generation of, of of Sherlockians and irregulars. They all grew up with Sherlock Holmes. He was all part of their childhoods. And to get together with a group of others at an event dedicated to kind of reliving that childhood wonder mm -hmm. would have appealed to Wolcott. I don't think there's any doubt about it. The the mystery element is absolutely right, as, as Steve says, but the, he also, as as Morley noted in in his review of of Wolcott's letters, he, he was a sentimental person too. Uh, he could be very warm hearted, and and this would have appealed to that portion of his personality to kind of sit back and and enjoy uh, those uh, others around him uh, in talking about this this man who never lived, but was such a big part of their lives. Yeah, I can see that. We it's hard for us. I mean, we've all grown up with Sherlock Holmes, but then, I mean, that was, 
you know, to be able to sit next to Sherlock Holmes. Gillette was Sherlock Holmes for America. To to sit next to Sherlock Holmes for a night, sit sit at a table. Yeah. With the guy and the other guy at the table is the one who illustrated the stories that you read as a boy. I mean, really, right, I mean let's face yeah. facts. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, who who wouldn't want to be involved in that if, right. if you've grown up loving the Sherlock Holmes stories, as, as Steve Rothman points out, you know, as they're coming out uh, and, you know, anxiously awaiting the next month's issue. Uh, and, you know, just not knowing what, what what's going to come up, what, what great case is going to happen next. Well, I think that I think. Um, all these things we're saying about Wilcutt's growing up with Holmes and loving mysteries and being sentimental about Steele and Gillette, those are all things that you could say about everybody in that room. So, so suddenly you get, a, you get an evolving picture of, yeah, if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna call, if you're gonna classify everybody else in that room as a Sherlockian, he counts too. I mean, you'd have to apply. Yeah. And I think that's very interesting. But that leads to that second question, which I think is a little more complicated. And that is, he was at the dinner, but was he considered an irregular? Yeah. So, so you know, that's, that's I think, a, a maybe a little bit more difficult kind of question to answer. Steve Rothman can can help with with kind of maybe the more some of the Morley perspective on that. But you know, prior to uh, us getting together, I I did a little dive into newspaper accounts from that period, and here's one from the the um, the St. Louis Globe Democrat for February 2, 1935. So you know, this was this was a couple of months afterward, and I I, I think this may have actually been something. I, I don't know if Vincent Sterrett wrote it, but it sure sounds like it because it, it helps promote Sterrett. It's a brief that showed up in several columns around the country devoted to books and book reviews. Among the Sherlock Holmes fans who gathered in New York recently for the first anniversary dinner of, by the way, this is incorrect, the Baker Street regulars, <laughs> was Vincent Sterrett, whose Private Life of Sherlock Holmes published last year by Macmillan, proved such a heartwarming book for many devotees who count Holmes the greatest detective of all fiction. Mr. Starrett rode up Fifth Avenue to the dinner in a handsome cab, sharing the cab with Alexander Wolcott, who wrote, he wore a large plaid cap and carried a magnifying glass. Christopher Morley heads the Baker Street regulars, who never admit that Sherlock Holmes is not a real person or that he is dead. So there you have it, Starrett, Morley, and Wolcott. Uh, you know, in the public's mind, uh, from from these these types of accounts, the three are related. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it's probably a good time to talk about what kicked me off on this whole train of thought, and another more proof that, of this relationship, at least as far as the, as Starrett and um, Wilcott go. Um, and gotta be honest, this, this this is a total surprise. So I found in my collection, you know, I. This happens a lot. I, I you, you know, when you collect books a long time, you forget what you have. And I, I, I have a copy of uh, Baker Street Studies um, by H.W. Uh, Bell, a British cornerstone volume of, of Shalakiana, um, collection of essays. And inside is the, uh, I'm gonna see it here, is an inscription, Alexander Wolcott from Vincent Sterrett, 12 December, 1934. I saw that, day. I was like, what? You know, so clearly just, what, is it two days? I forgot, what, what was the, how, just a couple of days after that dinner. Seven or something, I think. Something like that. And I remember thinking, why, why would, well, first of all, this was a gift from- The seven, yeah. Starrett to Woolcut after the uh, BSI dinner in New York City, the first one. And I thought to myself, well, that's weird. That's, well, there you go. That's really interesting. And to me, that was not just, that kind of went to that idea that, that um, Wolcott was not just, you know, a sort of afterthought or whatever. He was there, invited, and would have an interest in this because, because um, Starrett was going out of his way to give him a gift. Then I thought, well, why wouldn't he give him his own book? Which he then, may have already done. 
And then later on, a long series of, of uh, unlikely events, another volume, the British edition of The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes comes my way. And inside is another inscription. And it reads to Alexander Wolcott, a fellow traveler on a road of intangible inclinations, incidentally, a Sherlockian um, and a druid from Vincent Sterrett. And I thought, he's calling him a Sherlockian, fellow Sherlockian. And um, I don't think that they actually hammered out at this point three days later or whatever that yeah. uh, we're all going to be irregulars we're all going to have you know well, well that's just it you know that was during that amorphous period where you know uh, who was an irregular who wasn't an irregular i mean th that that's something that existed as as steve rothman has pointed out for for decades afterward and so um you know to to i, I think it's pretty clear that alexander wolcott at least in starrett's eyes had a strong interest in sherlock holmes and and Starrett wanted to feed that because it was not only good for his business, but you know, having someone of Wolcott stature uh, talking about Sherlock Holmes, um, you know, that's that, that that's pretty good for everybody as as far as he was concerned, and and it caught on too. Okay, so you saw that one story. Uh, there's another. There was another story ran in the Minneapolis Star on the 20th December 1933. Um, uh, I'm sorry. No, no. This is this is Allentown Morning Call. This is this this is about ten years later. Um, among the notable Holmes historians are uh, it's it's about it's an interview with uh, Edgar Smith. Uh, among the notable Holmes historians are Christopher Morley, Ellery Queen, Vincent Sterrett, Rex Stout, Louis Untermeyer, Elmer Davis, and Fletcher Pratt. The late Alexander Wolcott was a charter member of the Irregulars, and the late Haywood Brune was another admirer of the detective. I may have my dates of that story wrong because I'm working off the top of my head after a full gin and tonic. But the fact of the matter is that the, <laughs> the, writer, <laughs> the, the, the writer, the writer of, of that, you know, clearly designates uh, 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 Wolcott as an irregular. Uh, the uh, main interviewee in that story was Edgar W. Smith, who did not disagree with, with that point of view. And if you start taking a look at Associated Press stories, including some by Charlie Hans, who, you know, we know had a strong relationship to both Starrett and uh, to the Baker Street Irregulars. Um, uh, Wolcott is frequently mentioned as one of the earliest, if not a founding member of the Baker Street Irregulars. So, so that's something, and, and I, I found a story in, in the 1960s uh in in the st louis paper where you know they're still calling alexander wolcott one of the founding members of the baker street irregulars so so that's an idea that is at least exists out there in the public's mind whether it it it, it agrees with you know irregular history uh or not well, somewhere along the line the idea that he wasn't got some traction as well and um but um but what what do the irregulars say? I mean, what do, what do our own what does our own history say about this? Well, again, I think we start with more than anything else with what Robert Keith Levitt said in his um, whatever that article was called, um, where which appeared in the journal, and that was our really the first attempt, a regular attempt at history of the irregulars. And that was in 1934, 1963, 64, I think it was 63, um, but I don't have it in front of me. Um, and so that was a long piece and Levitt clearly hated, hated, hated Wolcott. Um, and he was there, he was there that night. So um, you have to give a certain amount of credence to some of the stuff Although some of the stories, like the story about who stole the hat, uh, the, the Deerstalker hat, become so confused that I don't think any of them knew, and they were all probably too drunk to realize. All you, they could say for sure is that uh, <laughs> Starrett did not leave with, or who was it who came with the hat? Was it? Um, well, so Wolcott at least had a Deerstalker uh, on when he walked in the room. Starrett's account indicates both he and Wolcott walked in the room with a deerstalker. And of course, William Gillette 
had a deer stalker on when he walked in the room too. That's there's at least three we know of. And somewhere along the line, they were playing um, three card Monty with these deer stalkers. I I think maybe they were all trying them on and seeing what they could do and if they could all look like the three stooges in them. Uh, <laughs> But you have an early, now, Steve, you have a list, right? An early. I, ha I have what is the earliest known membership list of the Irregulars. It's not all in Morley's hand, although a lot, a lot of the names are, at least it, it's hard to tell that it's not in Morley's hand because it's written in, um, in ink on cheap paper so that it's all spread and it doesn't look like Morley's normal hand. But a lot of them things have been corrected as far as addresses go and things like that in pencil. Now, one of the things of note in this list where Wolcott's name is there, it is on page one or two of this list and he's there with everybody else and it's crossed out, but other names are crossed out. Don Marquis's name is crossed out. Uh, uh, Steele's name is crossed out and a few others. Some of them are dead um, at that time. And it may well be that Wolcott's name was crossed out later after this, you know, some of these names were clearly crossed out in 37, 38, but, um, and Wolcott may have been crossed out in 43. Um, we don't know. All we know is uh, that this is the earliest list we've got. And because there is a list from 38 that uh, exists that's in Smith's hand and it still has Wolcott in it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you yeah. know, you gotta yeah. say that- um, I say he was in. Right, <laughs> Morley, Morley was looking at these lists. Morley gave this this particular list to Charlie Goodman, who was both his dentist, an irregular, and um, a friend and an, a hardcore collector. So, um, you know, you got to say, I think he was in. I mean, yes, he didn't get a shilling, but nobody had a shilling when he died. No, no there no, were no such right. animals. Um, right. I mean, right. they they'd given a certificate to FDR. That was it. Um, and but it didn't right. have a name. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing that people forget. You know, even Baker Street regulars that you know the uh, the very formalized uh, you know process of people becoming mysterious yet formalized a process of people becoming irregulars and then being presented with a certificate in a public moment and. That's a relatively modern innovation. I mean, looking back through the decades and decades of, of irregular history. And um, you get back this far and things start to get a bit fuzzy. And, um, and like we were saying earlier, loose. And um, um, yeah, I'm tend to, I tend to lean on the side of, uh, of uh, benefit of the doubt. I think he was in, I think, but that, but it, it, it's probably, this is probably given our, our time, gentlemen, this is probably the last um, and, and appropriate uh, topic. Was Woolcut being at that dinner, you know, let me put it this way. When I think about that dinner, at first I, th I always think, man, I wish I would have been there. <laughs> right, right? And then, but then I think, what an unlikely thing. You know, really, that that went on to become everything, and it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't no. make any sense at all. But for the fact that you have someone like Alexander Wilcott glamorizing it uh, in the years that come, and so I, my question is not only. In my opinion, I think not only is he in, but we owe him a lot um, in the in the Baker Street and in the Sherlockian universe, frankly. Otherwise, that dinner might have just, this is what I think. That dinner might have just come and gone. And that might have been it. And Morley himself might have been happy with that. <laughs> but but uh, you know, because late years later, he was always sort of rueful about the way you know, the thing grew and grew and grew but um but, well uh, you know I, there's no doubt about you know morley and steve is, is better on this than i am you know morley came to uh be disappointed in future gatherings because they started out as, as a bunch of his friends 
and and you know at one point he looks up in the room and and what happened to all of his friends you know there there are all these people there who were friends of friends of friends and and he doesn't know them and um you know that's it wasn't that wasn't what he set out to do it wasn't the kind of organization that he set out to create if he even had one in mind i mean the the fact that there was one dinner and that there was another dinner is actually the miraculous kind of thing um it this could have been just one dinner a once and done and 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 over um but you know people enjoy certainly enjoy themselves enough in that dinner at chris Jella's that there was another one and then another one and then another right. one so so you know i i certainly think that's true wolcott didn't sink it for for uh anyone uh his presence you know uh um may have been a little overwhelming at times but it, it wasn't um the end of the baker street irregulars because alec wolcott showed up and and you know took over a portion of the evening because that's who he was but my question is and maybe maybe it's, maybe the answer is no it doesn't it didn't make any difference in this regard whatsoever but I, I just, you know, the more I meditate on this and I, and I look at some of the things we've talked about, I start to think, no, not only this dinner was entirely in life, as you said, uh, Ray, you know, that there was a second dinner was kind of a, a miracle. But, but even at that, it's like, this, you know, a trajectory was almost charted. It seems like in retrospect, you can just see this, you know, this thing was launched. Nobody understood at the time, but I almost feel like it got a boost because, not entirely, of course, but I think it got a bit of a boost because of the, uh, for all his, you know, dominating the dinner, Wolcott was there and glamorized it and wrote about it, talked about it to his friends, and then they wrote about it. And next thing you know it's kind of it's got some traction and and that's and i you know i, I just I, I don't know i'm just sort of having a complete reevaluation of his role in, those, in that in that very big bang early moment of bsi dinner starting and um so i i, I would throw myself in with that theory if wolcott had ever showed up at another dinner yeah the, you know so sarah, sarah never showed up at another dinner um for for reasons you know that are known uh why did wolcott never show up at another dinner was was he never invited um did he you know because gillette was not going to be there did he not find it worth his time you know whatever um I, I think it's hard for me to feel like he was influential in the future of the group by his single presence at one dinner that's that's the only thing that stops me well, from i don't want to overstop anything the Steve Doyle train here. <laughs> my only thing is, my only thing is, I just feel like um, I don't want to say, oh, we're all here because of him. I, I won't go that far. But um, you know, a a very entertaining literary myth sprouted around him and be, him being there, and those kinds of stories. That's good PR. It's good PR for external audiences. And it's also good PR for people who might want to be in the group down the road. And um, so whether he came back or not, I'm just, I just think something about him being there that first dinner, I don't know. There's something more to that than I, I, I think it mattered more than we think it did. And um, that's just how I feel about it, though. Interesting. I don't know why I'm so sympathetic to him. He probably would have put the knife in my back, too. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I just, no I just see it. <laughs> well, guys, we're about out of time, darn it. All right. I just knew it would happen. Thank you, Steve. Um, oh, this was great. Oh, my gosh, this was fun. And there's more work to be done here, gentlemen. There is. I want to thank you for coming back on the show. And um, that's it. We are way over. I'm going to have to say goodbye, guys. And um, and your, your show, by the way, your, your show, love it, love it, love it, love it. I love Absolutely. every single episode. I look forward to them. I can't tell you how much I enjoy it. Well, thanks. Thank you. Sure. I really do appreciate that. Enjoy. Very, very much. All right. Great. And that's it for this episode of the Fortnite Dispatch. <laughs> that was fun. That was really great.
nothing like sitting around with a, your fellow Sherlockians, um, having a conversation about something like that. That was really fun. I um, I want to thank you for all your uh, again sounding like a broken record. Thank you for all your kind follow up. I do want to tell you and let you know that this is the um, final episode of this, the third season of the Fortnightly Dispatch. So we will be taking a hiatus over summer um, and the show will be returning in the fall. And so um, until then, I just hope you all have a great summer season and um, take care and attend your local science societies and read Sherlockian books, but mostly just have a good time and stay safe. And we'll see you when we come back next time. Mm -hmm.